Hello and welcome to another special interview. We're discussing the COVID-19 Prevention and Control Act. Uh, we did have the first part of our conversation with the Attorney General recently, and we'll be speaking now with the Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Sharon Belma George, where we'll be delving more on the health aspect of this act and what it really means for us in terms of prevent, uh, protecting us from COVID-19. Dr. George, thank you so much for coming in and for having this important conversation. Uh, before we get into COVID-19, I know that right now for St. Lucians, the dengue fever uh, it definitely has caught the attention of the public with the recent related death. Yes. And we are over 500 cases with the dengue. Um, but the ministry has been very proactive because even through our own uh, medium here at the GIS, we've been uh, speaking about the outbreak of dengue yes. uh can you give us uh, some insight as to what is the severity we're facing with dengue at this time well as most persons know dengue fever is endemic to st lucia that is it's one of the the diseases that we get um usually in low levels but usually with the rainy season between june and november we get increases in dengue fever traditionally here from earlier in the year, we've been monitoring the outbreaks of dengue fever in the region. For example, from Martinique has been having um, outbreaks and we have been looking at our mosquito indices around the island. Over the last month, we began to note um, increases in, in mosquito indices and also increases in cases when we did declare uh, a dengue fever outbreak. So within a very short period of time, we've just seen the numbers um, increasing and when we get a number of over 500 that is those that are confirmed we know that's just the the, the pick up the, uh, the iceberg because a lot of persons don't come in to get um, care um, what we also note that we have the serotypes 2 and 3 circulating and traditionally we've had the other serotypes as well so it puts us in, an, in a situation where um, persons who may have had dengue fever before are now at high risk for some of the complications um, of dengue fever. So it is extremely important that, um, first of all, the public health measures are enforced, which we have been doing, the surveillance on the ground, the fogging, the community activities, the health education as well, and the, the management and care to ensure that all of our healthcare workers are, are monitoring for complications of, of dengue fever. But we really want to urge the public that each and every one of us in our, our households, we need to ensure that we monitor around our home because the Aedes aegypti mosquito, which is the vector that spreads dengue fever, it's a, it's a household, it, it's, it's domestic. So it tends to breed in clear, clean water in and around your house, in any flower pots, in any containers around the house. So it's extremely important that we we break the, the the cycle of that of the mosquito so each and every one within first of all our households we do the necessary cleanups around to look for areas where mosquitoes can be breeding in buckets of water where a lot of persons because not of not having a regular water supply may decide to store water so we need to look around to see where if you have a lot of mosquitoes at your house you need to search for the breeding grounds of the mosquitoes um first of all after you've done that around your house on a community level, we need to look to see what are the issues that need to be addressed to, to reduce the collection of water in and around the home. Um, I also want to indicate that we've noticed that in the ages below 14 years, we've seen most of the cases and in young adults as well. So the public needs to be aware that the regular signs and symptoms, as most people, I think almost everybody knows somebody who has had dengue fever, the high fever, the retroorbital pain, that is a pain at the back of the head the the joint pains the feeling of weakness but you have to also monitor for signs of bleeding because your your blood platelets tend to go low and these are responsible for for clotting and that is where you can get some of the complications that can lead to to death in in relation to dengue fever so um as much as we man we're managing covid but we're managing a lot of other things at the same time and it is extremely important because um, we've had our first death, so we have to ensure that we, we manage and we're very vigilant in terms of the public knowing what the signs of complications are. If you're getting worse, you're getting vomiting, you're feeling very weak, 
you need to go to your nearest healthcare facility to get um, tested, to get checked as well, to ensure that the dehydration and everything else, you don't lead to a complication. So you mustn't stay home. Are there underlying conditions that would perhaps uh, make one more susceptible to the severity of dengue? Yes, as with persons with chronic conditions, the extreme age groups are very young and they're very old as well. Um, tend to be more and if you have any other severe like a heart condition this can also put you at greater risk for for getting compli a complication and, and one of the, the things is that if you've had dengue once or twice before and you're now getting a different because remember we have four serotypes you're now getting a new serotype you're even more susceptible to to bleeding out with dengue fever so um, this is serious, um, the public. We need to all play our part at the level of our household and community to try to reduce the, the mosquito indices within, within our homes. The public is concerned that they're not seeing the fogging. Yes. So the, the Department of Environmental Health has said, yes, we can fog, yes. but it's not necessarily the most effective. Right. You see, we've been fogging in our strategy. We've been looking at the places with the highest mosquito indices. And for this year, um, I have to indicate that you should, the, the progress of, of the, the cases happened within a very short period of time. And as much as we have some areas that are more highly affected, it is island-wide. Every single district we have a number of communities with dengue fever. So it, where. so it is difficult for us to fog everywhere at the same time. The Environmental Health Department, they have a schedule which they have been sharing so that communities are aware when they're coming in. But this is just one measure. The fogging kills the adult. However, if you kill the adult and you still have the other stages, the larvae, you have them breeding in, in, your, in your buckets at home, it means the adults die, new ones come up, and the cycle continues. So as much as we're trying to reduce the numbers with the fogging of the adults, we have to ensure we cut the cycle with the breeding grounds for those mosquitoes. And that would be the most effective way to reduce the mosquito population and as a consequence reduce the dengue fever numbers that we're seeing now and so it's a question for all of us to play our part all of us have to play, play our, our part. part okay let's get to the substantive matter at hand with covid 19 you know the state of emergency uh that came to an end with, and so the covid 19 uh, Pre Pre prevention and control act is now here we've heard the that the state of emergency perhaps would have been too much of a draconian measure to keep to keep yes. up with uh the quarantine act and the public health act we've been told woefully inadequate to be able to provide mm -hmm. your office with the sort of powers and provisions needed to to do what you need to do with covid 19. as succinctly as possible tell us why you are comfortable with having this covid 19 act in in as opposed to all the other forms? COVID-19 prevented a, it presented a very unique situation um, for us in terms of our public health response. As much as this is a respiratory illness, but the measures that needed to come into place um, to manage it were different to anything that we have implemented um, before within our time. When the outbreak started and we started seeing cases, and especially given that it is a new disease, all of the ministries of health around the world, everyone was monitoring, trying to get information on a disease which is new. A lot of the information that we need to manage was not available at the time because we were looking at how that disease was manifesting in other, in other countries. And a lot of the measures we put in place in the early days were to prevent the entry of COVID-19. When we got our first case in, in March, it was March 13th, and as the cases started to increase within the month of March, a number of very strict measures had to come into place within a very short period of time. Hence the decision on March 23rd to implement that state of emergency. Now the state of emergency gave the power for a very wide overarching um, activities and restrictions to be put in place in an effort to reduce any possibility to contain um, COVID-19 within that period. And from that period up to September 30th, it allowed us to put measures in place to reduce community spread, to reduce the impact that COVID-19 could have had on us during that period. 
since then, we've, we've had cases, we've been able to put those measures in place in a very effective way to reduce the possibility of um, deaths on our, in our community. However, as the number of months have passed, we've learned, we've seen what a lot of the other countries We've looked to see what are the most effective measures. We've adapted them to our um, own public health situation here in St. Lucia. And as has been predicted, COVID-19 is going to be here for a while. So it became necessary to get a specific um, piece of legislation to allow us to regulate, to contain, and to manage COVID-19 in a more effective um, way. The Public Health Act and the, the Quarantine Act, which are the main health acts that we use, um, on their review, they would not have been adequate to be able to cover a lot of the measures that had to be put in place to manage. The Public Health Act, um, of, it was from 1975 and revised in December of 2001, as you would imagine, is a very outdated act. Um, COVID-19 is not even in there as a, as a notifiable disease under there. And the measures that we use effectively to manage COVID-19, a lot of them were out of the public health um, realm. For example, um, the zoning, um, restricting movement of persons, um, the liquor, suspension of a liquor license, a lot of those don't fall under the Public Health Act. Um, the, the ports of entry, so there are Customs Act, there are um, acts under a lot of the other ministries which feed into those measures that we needed um, to be able to do. So this um, COVID-19 Prevention and Control Act, it actually allows you to regulate and contain in a more specific way, putting pieces of legislation that would have um, ordinarily belonged under different acts. If not, you'd have to now put amendments over a wide range of acts to be able to get everything that you need. So what we had to do was to look at, we reviewed, which we, we were familiar with, both the, the Public Health Act and the Quarantine Act, and looked at all of the gaps which would not um, allow us, give us the, the, the legislative um, backing to be able to, to implement. We've had to do things that we don't normally do. Under the Public Health Act, we normally, um, it's, it's mainly food establishments, um, offensive trade, new nuances, um, apartments and guest house, swimming pools, bakeries, human remains. But in terms of putting protocols for a, a hardware store, a lot of the, the new things that we had to put in place, physical distancing, um, use of, a lot of those don't fall under there. And given the wide range of, of, of things that needed to be implemented, it would have been very difficult to even try and, and just amend it to make it work and the time it would take to do that. So putting um, all of those measures, looking at the gaps in the Public Health Act and putting it into one act was the most effective way to be able to, to manage um, COVID-19 effectively. We are in the two year period. Yes. Um, for us in St. Lucia, I don't think that we're able to relate because COVID-19 is not sort of this prevalent threats yes. here so for us we're not able to compute why this two years because we will tell you well we have no COVID yes I think uh, we've been fortunate in St. Lucia not to experience what the rest of the world experience with COVID-19 we look at the the number of persons who had to be placed in ICU even in the developed world with um, healthcare capacity way surpassing our our possibilities here in St. Lucia and even on a regional basis when we look at our our sister countries we have been fortunate not, not to have to deal with um, the, the huge outbreak of COVID-19 which would stretch our our healthcare system and I think um, this has led to a level of complacency and persons not understanding the level of risk which still exists when we started off in the first few months of managing COVID-19 the numbers were a lot lower at present in october most countries are now going through their second wave we've cut with cases increasing in in u.s in the u.s in canada in the uk and closer to home a lot of our um caricom and oecs countries we have um jamaica the bahamas trinidad and tobago 
and even closer, Martinique, Guadeloupe. We have some of our other islands um, now going through community spread. So some of the islands that managed earlier, managed well earlier, are now seeing active outbreaks with deaths as well, um, and increasing increasing numbers within the community. So um, both um, Dr. Tedros of W. H O Dr. Carissa Etienne from PAHO, um, Dr. Joyce and John from, from CAFA, and even through our analysis locally, given what we expect to manage, we are a susceptible population. We expect to be seeing cases and managing waves for an extended period of time. So this bill, um, it gives us the capacity to be able to manage. And if you notice a lot of what is here, we are not, it's not presently enforced because here right now, St. Lucia is practically open with, with few exceptions. I mean, cruise, yachting, we're not fully within um, mass crowd. There are few activities that are still restricted because they're very high risk. But we've, we practically, we practically down to normal operations, managing with, with protocols. So it, what it does, it gives us the capacity, given that the rest of the world is still in very high risk, it now gives us the capacity to be able to manage within a short period of time if we were to develop um, community spread at any point. And we've, we've done a review of our system and we have seen that our vulnerabilities are very close by. We look at, we, our borders are now open. We look at the level of risk in our tourism destinations. It's high. A case can come in at any point through the numbers. And between October and December, our risk is even more, in, um, is even higher as our arrivals will be increased during that period. It's also a period where, because of the temperatures, etc., it's, uh, it's the flu season. So we expect mm -hmm. to see increases in, in respiratory tract infections at that point as well. Apart from that, specific to St. Lucia, our porous borders. We continue to get illegal entry coming from our high-risk neighbors, Martinique and Guadeloupe, coming in. Those are persons who are coming from areas of active um, disease coming into communities. We also look at the fact that we, we get breaches to home quarantine. We continue to get breaches to persons coming in from high risk. Presently, children, persons who with medical conditions, there are certain persons who've gone overseas to do surgery because of their condition, we give home quarantine and there are certain groups we allow it. It just takes one breach of home quarantine. And so far, 83 per, over 83% of our cases um, were returning nationals. Could you imagine if those persons were out in the community and um, went into the banks, went and especially since we notice a level of complacency with the protocols, we, we note that there's a reduced use of, of face masks within the community. So. It just takes one of those persons to break the protocol, get on a field bus where no one has a mask. This is a, a, a bus with 14, 15 persons on it. Those persons go home. That's community spread for us here. And each person with their family, with their community. So we've looked at all of the risks and all of the different um, possibilities where we can get cases introduced into St. Lucia. And the risk is high. At any point, we are at a good place now, but at any point we can get introduction of cases. And with the introduction of cases, it would mean now we would need to step back a bit. And as much as our plan and the setup of the public health system is to allow us to, to manage cases effectively because we've set up the network of clinics, we've set up the respiratory hospital, we have measures in place where we, we, we can manage a threshold of cases safely, but it is something we have to look at um, very closely as we see how the, the cases increase quickly in countries where it becomes infiltrated, especially if there's a level of complacency with the protocols. So given the level of risk, we need to be, um, our surveillance has to be um, high and we need to be um, prepared that if at any point we develop cases increases, increasing we can put the necessary measures in place in a very short period of time to allow an effective response let's look at the uh, go into the act it itself in section 10 we speak about the approval of testing and we know that testing is is key yes uh the the act speaks to uh the designation of a laboratory yes we the senusha medical and dental association is a bit concerned 
that the act was perhaps specifying only one lab would be accredited mm -hmm. uh, to, to perform tests. Can you explain to us how testing and, and the designation of laboratories would work? Okay, testing is an extremely important component of the response for COVID-19. And initially in our response, we relied on the Caribbean Public Health Agency to test and to give us this, those results. And there was a bit of a delay. So one of the one of the components that, um, thanks to the leadership of the, the lab, the Ezra Long lab that they were able to put in place is accurate, efficient, and sustainable testing um, locally so that we can get results within 24 hours. Given that we are dealing with a disease such as COVID and the capacity for spread, the capacity for complications, in the initial phase where we're still trying to manage and contain um, COVID-19, it is extremely important that whichever lab that is um, allowed or given permission to test the a level of the standard of the lab, the accuracy of the lab, and also it's important the, the type of test in terms of specificity and sensitivity of the test. So for us here, um, given that the gold standard for, for testing for COVID-19 is the PCR testing, we have to ensure that whichever lab is testing, whichever test that is being used is done um, accurately to give us a result. We can't have persons who are negative testing positive because it would mean we would not put you into care, we would not put you into a respiratory hospital where you can now get it because you're in an environment where there may be other persons and vice versa. We can't have someone who's positive getting a negative result and being sent home to their family. So in this phase, it is extremely important that wherever and whoever is doing the test is extremely accurate. There's a level of accountability there. There's a standardization of the, of the reporting mechanism as well. And also important is the appropriate management of the cases when diagnosed. So at this point, we have kept um, the testing within the national level. Also treatment and care, we've kept it at a national level to ensure that the same protocols for treatment and care are given. Notwithstanding, we anticipate within the next few months that WHO will approve rapid tests that are accurate enough. And given that, we expect based on the, the analysis that COVID-19 will be here for at least another two years. Once this comes into play and we get labs that are of the standard with testing that um, is accurate enough for us, it will be necessary to have a number of different labs also testing because it will increase the capacity of the country to be able to test. So this is one of the things that we are looking at. Other labs that can test give us accurate re um, results. However, the reporting mechanism, and that is why within our public health legislation, it's important that COVID-19 become a reportable disease, especially now. We will need to know who has it, those persons would need to be referred into our respiratory hospital because as much as possible we'd want to reduce um, community spread we wouldn't want different persons managing covid differently and end up with increased cases within the country so we need to have that uniformed, uh, approach. uniformed approach to it now on your advice the minister for health can prohibit the assembly of uh, two or more persons um, in a public space huh? Uh, physical distancing also been imposed. Yes. I think we, we, we have gotten accustomed to those uh, two protocols. But there remain the public concern that the measures are perhaps infringing on the rights of citizens. C can you give us a likely scenario that would trigger uh, a decision from your office, especially in, in restricting the assembly of, of individuals? Yes. Two, two people out in a public space, that sounds a bit yeah. drastic. Yeah, COVID-19 has presented us with so many unique situations and for us, the priority and the focus. And I think um, with this bill, we've lost focus on what we're trying to do. We have to remember what the bill is there for. It's to regulate and to contain an infectious disease which has the capacity to claim lives, lives of our most vulnerable within St. Lucia. Um, the measures to contain and to prevent is to reduce the transmission of COVID-19. It's a respiratory disease. 
where you have too many people gathered, there's that possibility of transfer of this virus from one person to the next. So the having people congregate, having too many people in any one space, um, as much as possible, if we are to get um, community spread, if we are to get increasing cases, those are some of the measures that we would need to put. And as much as it is um, inconvenient, because we, from as a healthcare system, we noted the increase in, in mental health issues during and after um, the, the curfew and the lockdown and asking people to stay home. We are social beings. It's difficult to tell us we can't go see some of the family members that are, that are very close to us. So apart from um, the possibility, there are certain um, rights that we have to look at what we're trying to do. We're trying to manage and, and, and monitor uh, an infectious disease. We're trying to contain and prevent. Our priority here is health and safety. So the inconvenience of a lot of those protocols, and it's inconvenient to all of us, and we're aware, but the priority is protecting health and safety um, first. And as much as it was hard in the beginning of the year, I think we, we have a lot to be thankful for that our relatives, our vulnerable groups are here with us. So we, we have to, we, yes, we have to balance it out, but we have to look at what the measures are for. At this point, where we have 28 cases and um, thankfully for one of our protocols, this was somebody who was already in government quarantine. So in terms of transmission, it was low. In terms of getting new cases, we didn't expect um, many cases coming out of this one because all of the protocols were, were followed as planned. So it reduces the, the, the impact. And yes, there are inconveniences. Quarantine is not easy for anyone and we are aware of that. But if it will reduce you spreading it to your family going home, um, we need to look at it that way. Okay. In section 19 with the response plan uh, and the recommendation coming out from uh, certain quarters is that maybe you should just allow, give a template so that someone can follow. Yes. Because as it is, businesses, individuals, they are being asked to devise their own plan and yes. present it for approval. How do, how do you know that they are along the, the right path? Perhaps it's time consuming to go back and to amend and... Yes, well, the plans that existed before the bill would still stand. Um, when we closed, after the shutdown, I think that was in, in April, our opening was in a, in a phased manner, looking at the most essential services first. And we, and we looked at the essential services and the level of risk of opening. So with each sector opening, there were protocols that this sector has to follow and the protocols are specific to the type of service that's being um, offered. We, they submitted their protocols, we reviewed, we also did reviews within the, the business place, for example. Now within each protocol, it's broken up into the, the infection prevention control, the disinfection and cleaning, the physical distancing. There are a number of sections of, of each protocol that is given to the service. Because we have a wide range of services, it is difficult to have one generic template. There are certain basic things that each service needs, but the services are so different. Now, each, each protocol, it speaks to what each service needs to have in the plan to make it easy for them to prepare the plan and submit to us. So yes, some parts are generic, but there are lots. For example, a supermarket would be very different to a bank, to say the rainforest um, hideaway or park. So because of this great difference, it's difficult to have just one generic template that everyone fills out. And it's dependent on where you're located, the size of your, of your business, the type of customers that you, that you get, what you sell, how you sell it, so it would be difficult to have just one template that everyone um, follows. But the ministry is working along with anyone who needs that yes. guidance. Yes, would, would the be environmental able to get health it. officers have been extremely busy working with the different um, entities to put, and if there is something missing, to make their recommendations to ensure that it's put in place to facilitate a speedy reopening. So the places that have already been opened um, through those um, plans and protocols they don't need to change. They, they've already been given the authorization and the act actually speaks to that, that those persons are already 
covered. Um, yeah, they're already covered. They've already been given their, their permission for, for opening. Let's talk about the medical information in section 57. Why is it necessary to collect, to use, and even share the help, uh, health information with a third party, whether it be in country or out country? I think this is an extremely important part of the, the COVID-19 prevention and control bill. And as you're speaking of health information, I think it's important that we highlight some areas within there that specifically mm -hmm. protects the public and their information. It says about the collection of health um, information and under section 50, it makes it clear that where the ministry collects health information directly from a person, the ministry at the time of collecting the health information ensure that the person is informed in a language that he or she understands. The fact that the information is collected, the purpose of it being collected, the recipients of the information, and who the name and address of the ministry um, collecting that information. There's a lot of other information as to why it's collected. Also, consent for processing of health information is also important. Subject to section 2, the ministry shall not process health information unless they've obtained the express consent of the person. So you sharing your information under the act, and it goes on to explain, apart from consent, the accuracy, the use of the information. And all of this is to protect person's information. Whatever information that we collect um, under COVID-19, as we do for other diseases, it's, it's collected by healthcare professionals towards health and safety of the individual. Now, in terms of the sharing of health information, given the nature of COVID-19, as we are managing the globe, this global pandemic, it becomes necessary, especially with the movement of persons to share information with consent of the person. I'll give you one scenario which we've, we've dealt with, and we've dealt with a lot of others. For example, someone who may have come through St. Lucia and goes to another island or country, and they're diagnosed with COVID-19. The CMO of that country would then call me and let me know this is the situation. And we've, we've had to deal with quite a few of those situations where someone may have come through our airport or come through um, the island. We had a national who went to another island and they tested positive. So a call from that CMO would now inform me so that we can do the necessary contact tracing. We can increase our surveillance. We can test. It's all to contain and to prevent the impact of, of COVID-19. So the, the information is shared in that way. Um, in a discreet way to allow us to do the necessary to, mm -hmm. to contain. So a lot of the times we may share data in terms of numbers, but not persons, but we don't give, even in, in, in our updates, we don't give people's names. We give general information. We don't give places, we don't give the store, we won't give the name of the hotel. As much as possible, we, we try to protect the, the privacy of people we try to protect the privacy of business places as much as is possible but there are certain instances where um, to protect health and safety to allow containment of the disease it becomes necessary to share um, health information with another country to allow them to do the necessary to contain COVID-19. We've seen the introduction of monitoring devices uh, yes. we have the bio sticker and there's also yes. a wristwatch and explain to us how the, these devices work. Yeah, it became necessary when we look at, um, like I said, we are now look moving on, moving on into living with COVID-19. As we move to the latter part of the year, we note that our government quarantine will have less space available to us. So home quarantine will become increased. And also with our planned opening for the alternative accommodation, that is the smaller villas and the smaller guest houses, it became necessary for us to get a more efficient way to be able to monitor um, breaches to quarantine or breaches to persons breaking the, the protocol for the accommodation um, sector. And given the, the human resource that is necessary to allow that would be exhaustive. You can't be everywhere in a community monitoring whether persons enter or leave. 
Um, we looked at those technologies to assist us in giving us timely information to reduce any possibility of impact. And this became relevant. Like I said earlier, at least 83% of our cases were returning nationals. And the number of breaches over the, the last couple few weeks, we've had over 24 breaches to home quarantine. Just imagine if those were positive cases. We got persons going into banks. We got persons going into supermarkets. We had someone who was selling in a community. All those breaches, if those persons were positive, well, we would definitely have had a level of community spread by now. So the... The, 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 the watch, for example, it allows us to be able to track and it's, it's specific to the parameter of wherever the person lives. If you live in a smaller place, then the parameter will be a lot uh, more restrictive as compared to if you live in a bigger estate. So what it would do, it would allow us to know if that, it would send us an alert if that person passes a certain um, distance from where they are. At. It does not take video it does not take conversations it just gives us the indication that you have passed a certain point um, the the button it allows us to monitor a person's vital signs remotely so your temperature your pulse your respiratory rate and certain signs and symptoms of COVID-19 we'll be able to pick this up remotely I also need to indicate that this is information that we are already collecting when we monitor persons within um, home quarantine and all of this information is collected by healthcare professionals we have we collect a lot more information routinely on persons so it's not any information that is more than what we routinely collect and it is only going to be collected um, during that 14 day period while you are either in quarantine or within an alternative um, accommodation sector so is it free um, no, it's not free of charge. You would need to pay for the watch and for the and for the bio button, the bio, okay. the bio sticker. But the cost of having this within the 14 days would work out a lot cheaper than if you were to pay, for example, for for quarantine. And when you look at the the level of human resource that we would need to be able to ma to monitor the number of persons in home quarantine. This would be a more accurate measure for us. We, if someone spikes a temperature or develops a cough, we would now have an objective measure to be able to pick that up um, as soon as it happens to ensure that that person is taken into care and tested instead of us um, waiting for a visit or waiting for them to indicate that to us. So it would provide us with a more objective measure. And the monitoring yeah. takes place by oh. healthcare professionals, remotely by healthcare professionals. And so they will be receiving the signals, the alerts. And right. So forth. They would be we'd be receiving it and then if need be, then we can alert the Royal St. Lucia Police Force. They have been working um closely with us, especially on the breaches to, to home quarantine, because anyone who breaches home quarantine is immediately taken to our government quarantine site. While well, we're on quarantine, so we have been saying for quite some time that the cost of quarantine would be passed on yes. to individuals that the government would no longer be able to bear that full cost uh we are here in the public you and cry it is a bit exorbitant in in the minds of yes. of many um can you explain the fee structure to us and how were these fees arrived at um the fee structure is based on the hotel's cost um, for persons coming in for quarantine, those will be paid directly to the hotel. It's not a fee going to the government. It is a fee going directly to the hotel for the stay there. It includes the stay. It includes the meals. It includes care. It includes everything um, there. So this is a fee you pay to the hotel for the quarantine period. Um, where government comes in will be our healthcare professionals at the hotel. Um, doing the monitoring of the health aspects, the vital signs. Um, we provide health care, persons who are there, because we get persons with chronic conditions, and we also do the testing. So the, the actual quarantine um, facility will now be in the hands of the hotel. The hotel will be the one. Th these are the fees to cover the hotel stay and the meals. Our part will be the health care monitoring while persons are there for the period of time. Mm. And the, there is now the provision for individuals to spend seven days in quarantine at the facility 
and then seven days home how do we know that this is a safe measure because we know that someone can develop covid well into a 14-day right. period yes um that is why it is extremely important that people understand that quarantine is 14 days the safe period is the full 14 days based on limitations in in quarantine capacity and also to reduce the cost what we do at seven days within um state quarantine we test at the seventh day now the seventh day it provides some coverage but it's not a hundred percent um risk-free about 70 to 80 percent of persons who've been exposed to covid 19 will develop um covid 19 signs and symptoms and be picked up by the seventh day so usually by the seventh day we do the test and we usually get the result by the eighth ninth day if you're negative what we advise is that you spend up to the 14th day in home quarantine so you're not free to roam you're not free to go out it means you would have to have the conditions for home quarantine that is a room and a bathroom and you should be staying in your home because you're still a threat we still have at least 30 percent of persons who can develop COVID-19 um, in, the, in the last period of, of the quarantine time. So even if you're, re you're released from the, the state quarantine, it is still important that you stay in up to day 14. So we are taking a level of risk by allowing persons into their home for the tail period, but it's a lower risk looking at the cost and looking at the possibility of developing um, COVID-19. Now, would these individuals be required to get the bio stick or the wristwatch? Yes, for the, uh, for the, the final for the seven days, days at home to ensure that they're staying in um, as much as possible. Right. For your ministry, you see this as being quite a task uh, because whereas you have the act which gives you all of these powers and provisions to do what needs to be done, in terms of the public cooperation, public understanding, the public yes. patience. Yes. Um, I think generally for a lot of the protocols, um, we have received the cooperation of the public. And if we were to just stay from a policy level and put laws and put protocols, as we've seen in some other countries where the adherence and compliance led to community outbreak because people just didn't listen. I think for St. Lucia, it's different. Generally, our population, people have taken COVID-19 seriously. They've adhered and they've done what needed to be done to protect our more vulnerable people. However, we still have, especially at the level of the community, groups who are resistant um, to those. And um, unfortunately, they present a risk to, to the rest of us who may be complying um, developing the illness so hence the reason why um, we needed to have the legislative um, backing there and also on an enforcement part given the the crime and all other things that the Royal St. Lucia police force has to do it's not realistic to expect the police to be in all of the communities monitoring persons on home quarantine monitoring some um, stores our environmental health officers are stretched thin we can't have them in all establishments ensuring that the number of persons who come in the persons wearing a mask physical distancing is almost impossible to allow that level of um, enforcement from from any entity so keeping those those measures is really and we've noted when we do our reviews within the community there are some groups that just don't adhere they just don't adhere and hence um um the need for 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 some for some level of of a fine or imprisonment or something to to try to encourage people to stay there are people who would just be difficult um either way but for saint Lucia, you can see that if we are to stick to yes. what we've been doing and yes. improve on that right we can be relatively safe with COVID-19. We can be. We've demonstrated that the protocols work and the protocols work effectively. The case, we had a positive case come into one of our hotels and because of the adherence to the protocols, our, our hotel workers were safe. The other guests were safe. Our communities remain safe. We so the protocols are actually produced so that if there's a positive case, 
coming in and you are here, transmission would be next to nothing. If a positive case were to come into the supermarket and they adhere to the protocols, there should be no transmission to, to the staff there, to other people using the supermarket. Our reality is we have to learn to live with COVID. We have to learn to manage. We can't close up every time we get cases. Cases will come. We have to be aware of the risk of cases coming and we have to be prepared to manage them effectively and continue living. We can't keep, we can't keep ourselves closed. We can't keep the new set of complications developed from that. So at this stage and um, as um, it's predicted by our other public health agencies, this will be an inconvenience for another couple of years. But we, we need to look at the, some of the positives because we have had gains um, coming out of COVID-19 and the development of our port health system, the, the development of our lab system, because apart from COVID-19 testing, the, the PCR capacity, we can now test and stereotype, for example, dengue, leptospirosis. There's a whole new set of viral illnesses that we can now diagnose locally, which before that capacity, we were not able to do it. So even within the system, it has provided certain opportunities. It has strengthened our system um, in many other ways as well. All right. Thank you so much, uh, the Chief Medical Officer there, Dr. Sean Belmont George, speaking with us, looking at the COVID-19 Prevention and Control Act. I want to say thank you so much for watching this special production by the National Television Network, Government Information Service. I am Melissa Joseph saying goodbye.